Hello all, thank you for being with us today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Remember that this Sunday, June 13th, from 1 to 4 p.m. here at the museums, blues musician and muralist Bobby Whalen will perform in conjunction with our exhibit, Mississippi Distilled, Prohibition, Piety, and Politics. And remember also that admission to the museums is free on Sundays. You can find more about that event on the department's uh, social media pages. And then join us next week for History's Lunch when Curtis Wilkie will be with us to discuss his new book, When Evil Lived in Laurel, the White Knights, and the Murder of Vernon Damer. Today, we are delighted to have Josh Parshall presenting Digital History and Jewish Mississippi, Revisions to the Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities. Since July 2017, Josh Parshall has served as Director of History for the Institute of Southern Jewish Life in Jackson. He was the organization's oral historian from 2009 to 2013. Marshall earned his BA from the University of Kansas and his MA and PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Help me welcome Josh Parshall. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Chris. The mic works. All right. It's great to be here. I think I probably attended my first History as Lunch in 2009. So it's probably been about 12 years, and I get to do it my own now. Um, so uh, Chris actually introduced me. I won't really add too much more to that. Um, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life, uh, where I've worked for a total of eight years, uh, supports, connects, and celebrates Jewish life in the South. And part of that mission involves telling Jewish stories, right? It involves uh, preserving Jewish history, disseminating Jewish history, uh, and interpreting Jewish history. And one of the most public-facing ways that we do that is through our Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities, I'm going to get in a little bit uh, and give a, a history of it to you. Um, but what we're talking about today is recent revisions to the Mississippi section of that encyclopedia. So I'll talk about the encyclopedia. I'll talk a little bit about Jewish history in Mississippi, just because I know not everyone in this room is Jewish, and so it might, and, and those of us who are Jewish don't necessarily know this history. Um, and so it'll be good to get a little grounding there. I'll talk a little bit about my original plans uh, to work on the encyclopedia beginning in spring 2020, plans that didn't go as planned. Um, I'll talk about changes in the online environment, how the new revisions are partly about the ways that the internet has changed uh, in 15 years, and then dig in a little bit with some examples of content that's been updated. So the uh, history of the encyclopedia really goes back to the early days of the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. Um, it started with this effort to preserve stories, especially of small towns, but also of our medium-sized towns and big cities. Um, in the South and to, to tell the Jewish stories. Uh, as I'll talk about, right, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of change happening in the Jewish South uh, in the years leading up to the foundation of the ISJL in uh, 2000. Um, and so we've got these, these folders, right? They're organized first by state and then by local community. And mostly what's in there is reproductions either of uh, materials from our own archives. For, for several years, uh, the ISJL uh, operated the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. Um, so there's, there's copies of things from our own archives, there's copies of things from other rep repositories, and there's a really wide variety of material. Right? And I just want to go back. So this is my new office. We recently moved in. Uh, we moved our offices to Beth Israel Congregation on Old Canton. And um, this is a full wall. Uh, and the middle three uh, filing cabinets there are pretty much chock full of local community documents. Again, mostly not originals. Um, so what's in there? Uh, you've got handwritten notes, you've got published materials maybe that uh, were published locally and we made some copies when we went to like a local library. Um, you've got city directories, occasionally you have congregational histories, 
Um, if there have been a bunch of them printed, maybe we have an original copy. In some cases, what we've got is a, a facsimile. Um, and most of this material was amassed during the tenure of Dr. Stuart Rockoff. Um, so Stuart arrived uh, at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life uh, in about 2002. He was hired uh, by Macy Hart, uh, who's sitting over here, um, and is the founder and, and uh, uh, first president of the Institute of Southern Jewish Life for CEO. Um, Stuart has a PhD from the University of Texas, and he's really the primary person responsible for making the Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities a reality. So that first period, it was originally actually known as the ISJL Digital History Archive. The idea being that they wanted to create something that would take all these file folders full of information about Jewish communities in the region and find a way to put that online. But the form that it actually took was really uh, encyclopedia entries. I think the words that Stuart always used to use were uh, um, something like accessible but substantive local Jewish histories. Um, and so it really took the form of encyclopedia articles and then took the name Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities. This is a screenshot of the encyclopedia as it existed circa maybe 2011 or 2012. At that point, we hadn't done Oklahoma, Kentucky, or Virginia, and it was unclear to what extent we would be writing about Florida. Um, I think, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So part of the um, great things about the encyclopedia is that it's uh, brought in a lot of different hands. And a lot of the folks who've written encyclopedia articles have actually been uh, our summer interns. And Stuart really developed this program. So you see interns here visiting the Mississippi Delta in 2013, a group of interns in the office in 2011. This 2012 picture is oral history intern Tracy Pfeiffer uh, hopping a fence in order to do a cemetery census in Orange, Texas. I was with her. I think I'm the one that took that picture of Tracy hopping the fence. Um, you know, and, and this is, uh, the fence hopping is a great example of this hands-on practical history experience that we've been able to provide for our interns. Um, as well as, of course, sort of these travel opportunities. You know, you, we, these are nationwide searches. Some of our interns do come from Mississippi or elsewhere in the region. Uh, some of our interns come from uh, other parts of the country, and we get to really show them uh, Mississippi and show them the South, and we take a lot of pride in the, the experiences that we offer those interns. So, um, the encyclopedia launched in 2006. Mississippi was the first state. Um, Arkansas came six-ish month af six months after, in 2007. Uh, the Arkansas section of the encyclopedia was published with 17 communities. That was largely based on one book. There's a big, thick book of Arkansas Jewish history by a woman named Carolyn Gray Lamaster. Um, and then in fall 2007, Stewart finalized the Louisiana uh, section of the encyclopedia with an additional 20 communities. Louisiana, as I'm going to talk about, was the first state um, that just had one entry for each town. In Mississippi and Arkansas, Stuart had written a community Jewish history and then separately had a link that talked about the histories of any of the Jewish congregations that were in that town. Um, at, Louis, at the point of Louisiana, I think, is when he realized that wasn't necessarily going to be sustainable because Louisiana has New Orleans. Right? And these large, large metro areas to really get detailed histories of the number of congregations that you see in a bigger city was going to be pretty challenging. So at that point, we've just got sort of the single community history, and that's been the structure that's followed in every state since then. At that point, he went to work on Alabama. That pace continued, and Stuart had completed 12 states before departing the IS jail in 2013 to become the executive director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. Um, at that point, we had 12 states, no Florida yet, and more than 250 entries. Now, I forgot to mention sort of what qualifies a place for inclusion in the encyclopedia. Essentially, anywhere that a local Jewish community established what was intended to be a permanent institution was our original bar for entry. So that if there was a cemetery, um, if there was a congregation, uh, or in some cases you see sort of a Jewish community center or something like that, um, 
that, that was intended to be a permanent institution, um, in most cases we're looking for places that held some kind of property at some point. Um, that sort of has been the bar for entry. There's a little bit of, of gray area at sort of the margins there. Uh, in addition to, okay, so Stuart had gone through to Florida. Um, I joined the ISJL in 2009 and, uh, as an oral historian. Oral history has been a part of the ISJL's work for a long time. Our, some of our oral history collections actually precede the founding of the Institute of Southern Jewish Life itself. Um, and the oral history has been an important part of the research process, for one thing, so that in some of the grants that uh, Stuart received to do our research in places like Texas and Oklahoma, I would be sent out to do some of the research for him, um, and that we would also use oral histories to supplement the paper record. When we're talking about Jewish life, especially in our smallest towns, and also when we're talking about the experiences of women uh, that tend to not to be quite as well documented in the paper record, oral history is a really, really valuable tool. It's also a really good tool for just getting the texture of Jewish life. You can give a bunch of names and dates. You can talk about the religious practices of a given community. You can talk about where they came from. It's really nice to be able to hear somebody's voice, especially when that voice has a nice, rich accent to it. Um, and to hear them talk about, uh, you know, really the experience of being Jewish in some of these places, especially our smaller towns. The example you see here, this is Sarah Stone. She lived her adult life in New Orleans and was a really prominent uh, person within the Jewish community there. But she had grown up in Bogalusa, Louisiana. And so here she's talking about growing up Jewish in Bogalusa. And from 2009 to 2013, we began integrating some of these oral history clips into the encyclopedia. It's not, it's a minority of the entries that actually have these oral history clips attached, um, but they are a really nice source. And it showed really even between 2006, when embedding videos like that would have been something you'd have to sort of think about, you know, by 2013, it was a you know, fairly easy thing, right? You throw the video on YouTube, you drop the YouTube video onto your web page. It's easy to do. And that, you know, is my original role at the ISJL, is that oral history stuff. So I left for a little bit, um, went and got a PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and came back in 2017. I jumped ahead of myself, I'm going to go back. Um, upon returning to the ISJL, I took a year to sort of get my legs back under me, um, reboot various aspects of the history department, um, and then in 2018, 18, I turned my sights to Florida. And I sort of made this case that we should do all of Florida. Uh, Florida historically is very Southern, even if Southern Florida has had sort of a different trajectory since roughly the 1940s. Um, Florida brought our total entries up to about 300 entries in the encyclopedia. And when that was done, I learned a few things about how I could make it look uh, now, how I could make some of our pages look a little more up to date, a little more contemporary and started really in earnest that revision process. So in 2020, spring 2020, I was really looking to start this process of going back to our first state, starting close to home, and looking at our earliest entries and figuring out what to do about them. And before I talk about that, I just want to give like a brief overview of Jewish history in Mississippi so that we're on a little bit of the same page. And obviously, I'm happy to answer specific questions uh, after the talk. So there were Jews in parts of Mississippi as early as the late 18th century, and the first significant Jewish population developed in Natchez. Jews in Natchez held religious services as early as 1800, and they developed the state's first congregation, B'nai Israel, which means children of Israel, in 1840. The other antebellum uh, Jewish congregation in the state of Mississippi was in Vicksburg. Right? It's no coincidence that these are on river ports. Right? There, we see Jews uh, oftentimes coming up from New Orleans, not in all cases, but often coming up from New Orleans and finding opportunities in these river trading ports uh, prior to the Civil War. These are the two places we have congregations. Uh, during, the, uh, during the Civil War, Jewish Mississippians uh, typically supported and fought for the Confederacy. Uh, when we look at the South as a whole, Jews tended to be enslavers at roughly the same rate as white peers in the places they lived. Now, Jews were more urban than the overall white population of the South, and so when they, uh, they tended to enslave a smaller number of people who worked in the home or perhaps in, uh, in a shop. Jews tended, had sort of gravitated towards the uh, merchant professions, really since arrival in the American South. And in Mississippi, you do see, again, um, support for the Confederacy in general among the Jews living here. 
in the Reconstruction era, there's a lot more Jewish growth in the South. Partly the breakdown of the slave economies meant that there was a new sort of commercial economy rising in the South. There was a need for merchants. There was a need for retail trade. Jews in the region, and there's a lot of writing on this, Jews in the region had access to credit, which was in short supply in the South, in part through kinship networks that connected Jewish businesses in a place like Mississippi uh, to wholesale distributors, uh, maybe elsewhere in the region, and beyond that uh, to buyers as well as suppliers in other places. You also see at this time Jews getting involved in the cotton trade itself. And then post-Reconstruction, um, one sign of some of the Jewish success and some of the relative acceptance of Jews in Mississippi uh, is the visibility of Jewish mayors. So the ISJL as part of the encyclopedia maintains a list of Jewish mayors in southern towns, and you see a number of examples uh, in the 1870s and the, uh, through the 1890s. So Simon Unger uh, in Port Gibson, uh, 1891 to 1898, was our other late 19th century. Isaac Lowenberg and Natchez and um, Abraham Lewenthal in Brookhaven are a few of our examples in Mississippi. You see this across the South. So there is this moment uh, really of, of Jewish success. Uh, it's not all that story. There's a lot else going on. A lot of people fail and leave the area, right? There's a lot of mobility at the time. But you do see these examples of Jewish success. You see these examples of relative civic integration. Um, you also see a period of, of rising anti-Semitism and a level of danger, right? So there's a risk-reward sort of thing here. Um, in Mississippi, in the post-Reconstruction era, you had uh, the White Cappers, who are a vigilante group in southwest Mississippi who actively targeted uh, at least one Jewish individual sort of based on his Jewishness at that time. Um, they were also white supremacists, of course, uh, and targeted uh, some of his black uh, renters. This person owned land, and they objected to that. Um, you see some increase in social restrictions right at the end of the 19th century. Um, but despite that, there are these successful Jews in a number of Mississippi towns um, who are, again, doing things like becoming mayors. Um, Jewish growth in that late 19th century period, the biggest growth is in the Delta, right? So where you see general growth, you see Jewish growth for most of Mississippi history. By the early 20th century, we've got some more changes happening. Uh, Eastern European Jews are arriving. A lot of our early Jewish arrivals were from Central Europe, uh, either Alsatian Jews or Jews from Germany uh, or Prussia or Poland. Um, that sort of the sources of Jewish migration shift east by the early 20th century, that changes somewhat the ethnic and religious practices of Jews in the state. You also see changes in where the Jewish population is growing. Del the Delta really becomes the center of Jewish life in the state uh, in the early 20th century, whereas Natchez, which had long really held th that title, uh, peaks right in the early 20th century. The other big signal sort of event in Jewish history in Mississippi is, of course, the Civil Rights Movement. We have a handful of progressive Jewish Mississippians who supported desegregation and black voting rights. Among them is Perry Nussbaum, who you see on the right. Um, he was the rabbi in town. He, of course, is probably most famous for ministering to uh, arrested activists during the Freedom Rides and going up to Parchment um, to uh, bring them letters from home, to take letters from home from them, to take them cigarettes, and just to counsel to them. Um, there was a heavy representation of Jews among white activists during uh, the 1960s civil rights movement. Um, uh, I should also mention Charles uh, Mantenban, the rabbi in Hattiesburg, was the other of the Mississippi rabbis who was willing to visit Parchman during that period and was really known for uh, racial progressivism uh, and in a, a you know, support of desegregation. Um, locally, we should mention Beatrice Gotthelf and other families who are involved in some uh, cross-racial organizing efforts during that time. But So we've got these progressive Jewish Mississippians, right, who in some ways are, are responding to both their own consciousness, their own consciousness, as well as uh, the expectation of national Jewish groups, which in general supported desegregation um, as a cause. Um, we've also got those Jews in Mississippi who uh, responded really strongly in the opposite direction, and there were prominent Jewish segregationists in the state. Clarksdale, Mississippi, hired Rabbi Benjamin Schwartz. Um, he was, in, some, in a lot of Jewish circles, he was sort of a uh, persona non grata in the United States. He had led this Jewish anti-communist organization in the 1950s and had taken shots at some really prominent uh, and important Jewish figures. 
and uh, it would have been hard for him to find a pulpit in a lot of places. Um, but for the Clarksdale Jews, uh, who didn't want a rabbi who was going to stir up controversy on civil rights, um, Rabbi, uh, rabbi Schwartz was a, a pretty good bet um, because he really viewed the civil rights movement really skeptically, in part because he thought of civil rights activists as communist pawns. He had, this, again, this strong dedication to anti-communism. Um, another example, uh, I'm not showing it here today, but there was a pro-segregation pamphlet that was written by a uh, Jewish member of the White Citizens Council in Greenwood, Mississippi, um, that was published probably in the late uh, 1960s and a sort of further evidence of the ways that some Mississippi Jews really did, uh, had absorbed and espoused uh, tenets of white supremacy here. Since that time, there's been a lot of changes uh, in the Jewish South and a lot of changes in Jewish Mississippi. So overall, Mississippi's Jewish population has declined uh, since uh, maybe 1960 or so. Um, since 2000, we've had synagogue closures in Clarksdale, Mississippi, in Brookhaven, and in Lexington. Lexington is pictured here, and that synagogue closed in 2009. Jackson is now the largest Jewish community in the state, um, but it also has lost Jewish population since its peak years. And this is in the context of overall Jewish growth in the South. The Jewish population of the South is larger now than it's ever been, and that's due to a massive increase in the number of Jewish people living in Atlanta, um, significant increases in some of the other major metropolitan areas like Houston or Dallas uh, or Charlotte. So that's, again, the briefest of overviews that I could manage. Um, but here's what I was going to do, right? So uh, that's sort of the state of Mississippi Jewish history. I wanted to go back, uh, you know, freshen up all these pages, make sure everything was up to date, make sure that everything was accurate, make sure that we were really giving a strong history. Um, so in late February 2020, I had hired three incredible summer interns. I hired them along with my colleague Nora Katz um, to help out with Mississippi updates and to do some other tasks for us. I'd applied for a mini grant from the Mississippi Humanities Council to, to cover travel expenses for the summer. There were going to be four of us on the road. You know, that, that gets expensive pretty quickly. So I'd applied for a $2,000 grant to cover some of that travel. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And it really threw our plans. I guess the, uh, the pandemic hit right before I received notification that I, had, that I was going to be getting the grant from the Humanities Council. And we really were, you know, at, like everybody, we were scrambling. So within, um, it took about a month, but we decided there was no way for us to uh, have the internship. We didn't know if it would be safe for our interns to come be here. Uh, a lot of stuff was up in the air, including, I think, for nonprofits, a, a real questions about sort of their financial stability over the next year. We didn't know uh, what was going to happen. Um, and we also decided that it wouldn't be possible to offer the internship remotely. I just wasn't in a place to be scanning a bunch of things and sending it to folks and then having them do the writing. It just didn't feel like the internship sort of as we'd done it before. So we opted not to. Um, and then the question remained how to uh, attack the Mississippi work, how to take advantage of that grant funding. Um, and the answer is really that I could do most of the work remotely. It's not as fun. I don't get to visit the places. I don't get to eat the local food. Uh, I don't get to shake hands and do oral history interviews the same way and that kind of thing. I don't get to be in people's homes and get that really nice sense of what the community is like. But there's still a lot you can do online, right? In 2006, when we started, it was much harder. But now, you know, it's significantly easier to do those sorts of things. Also, I was working from the basis of all these file folders that already existed. So it wasn't as if I was starting from scratch and was going to need to turn over every stone in some of these small towns. But uh, it was going to be slower. Um, I was, of course, balancing childcare like so many people. Um, I didn't have my interns, so I knew that sort of the timeline that I had anticipated for those Mississippi revisions was going to be uh, longer. And I realized I probably wasn't going to be able to spend all the grant money, but went ahead. So here are some of the changes we've been making. The first changes uh, are to the structure. So I mentioned these, these you know, local histories then with um, sort of sidebars with a couple resources. So you can see that over here. Um, is this, I get ahead of myself somehow? Anyways, um, it used to be that over under resources you would have a separate entry for the congregational history in a place like Brookhaven. So you'd have, um, you know, that's now removed and the Brookhaven 
congregational history is sort of integrated into that overall history. Um, so that's a change that sort of streamlines things. There are benefits to this structure of having the separate entries. I think in a mid-sized town, it's really nice. I think it works really well in Shreveport or Little Rock to read the Jewish history of the place, uh, sort of learn about Jewish social life, learn about the history of immigration, learn about, um, say, uh, you know, Jewish contributions to the, the local economy and things like that, and then to have separate entries, especially when you've got more than one synagogue. Both Little Rock and Shreveport have supported and continue to support two synagogues. In a place like Jackson, I don't think that's quite as necessary. And it's not that Jewish history in Jackson is coterminous with the history of our local congregation, but they're so much bound up together. And this would be especially true in a place like Lexington. They're so much bound up together that really um, you end up having redundancies, I think, between the two entries. So I've eliminated that and tried to streamline things that way. Um, one of the other structural changes that's going to um, gonna happen um, is with our cemetery list. So a number of our Mississippi entries, as well as in other states, have a cemetery census attached. Uh, these are really great resources. I get a lot of contacts from people who are doing Jewish genealogy in the region. Um, and I wanna, we need to change these to be, uh, to really operate as like sortable tables. So we need to, I'm gonna take these lists, uh, move them into, say, a Google Sheet, and then embed that sheet back on the site. That makes it easier for me to update them. It also makes them, you know, for someone else, to really use it as a data set, right? So you could sort by date of birth or date of death or, or sort by, you know, first name or last name or whatever you wanted to do. Um, that is a change that I've already made with that mayor list that I showed you. That had been sort of a static block of text on the page. And now it's much easier for me to update, again, by moving it into sort of a, a, a cloud-based data set um, that then is displayed on the page. The other big change um, has to do with the la online landscape. Um, so this, I found this the other day. This is actually a, a screen grab of our website prior to the launching of the, uh, of the encyclopedia. This is probably its like earliest iteration, is that about right? I'm looking to Macy for confirmation over here. Um, this is not what websites look like anymore, right? Um, in part, when I say that the, the landscape of the internet has changed, one thing we're talking about is that like literally uh, a lot of the screens we're using have much more dramatic landscape ratios. So a page like this doesn't quite work uh, on the sort of widescreen that we've got here today um, on a laptop or a desktop screen. Um, and so in order to sort of fit this new landscape, we have to change our images. Um, we have larger screens, we have higher internet speeds, that means that we need to use better pictures. So there's a couple things that involves. One is linking to the original picture and also having a light box feature. So that, for example, on this uh, Columbus, Mississippi page, if you click this image, you get a larger version of it that pops up for you. Right? I want people to be able to look closely at our images and do some analysis of their own if they'd like to. In other cases, like in many, many, many of our Florida pages, that means linking to the original source. A lot of our images for our Florida entries come from a really wonderful uh, photographic collection that's housed at the State Archives of Florida. And so for those, if you click on the picture in a new tab, you're gonna get a large, sort of the full-scale version of that digital image with a whole bunch of extra information about where it, come from, where it came from, when it might have been taken, in some cases, the names of everybody who's pictured there. Uh, the other one the thing to say about this is what's become much more popular now. So our early entries a lot of times had photographs like this uh, inset into the corners of paragraphs, right? And what's become a lot more popular now is to have a nice wide image that's just between two blocks of text. In part, that means that your, your entry is gonna work better on a phone. You're less likely to have formatting issues as you switch between devices. So again, that's why in Columbus, I just took this postcard or even a copy of a postcard, put it nice and big right there in the middle. And then this last structural change I wanna talk about is links. So uh, both making sure that we're really consistent with our internal links. If you're reading about Jackson, Mississippi, and it says that so-and-so moved from Greenwood, Mississippi, you're gonna get a link to open up our Greenwood page to learn further about Greenwood. 
Another really nice thing that we can do now versus 2006 is to link to that wide variety of other historical sources and historical resources that are available on other sites. So for example, if you're reading through this Columbus, Mississippi entry, the first two links will take you to the Mississippi Encyclopedia, to the online version of that, um, which is published by the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi uh, and is also supported by the Mississippi Humanities Council. So in addition to sort of responding to the, all the changes online, I've been making sure to sort of improve our content. And this happens a couple of different ways. This is uh, B'nai Israel Congregation in Hattiesburg, by the way. So the first thing is updates. So it's actually interesting. I don't believe, I think that every synagogue closure to happen in Mississippi since the beginning of the encyclopedia had actually already been noted. I didn't have closures that I needed to bring into the entries. Um, but I had had some other changes, right? Um, this will mean sort of updating religious leadership, right? So uh, who is Greenville now bringing in for monthly services? Uh, you know, which Mississippi State professor is running uh, occasional services over in Columbus, that sort of thing. Um, this also means updating where we have, you know, currently have religious schools or where there have ceased to be enough Jewish children to have a religious school. That's an easy thing for the ISJL to find out because in many cases we provide the curriculum for them. Um, so just uh, as a recent example of these updates, um, Adath Israel, the congregation in Cleveland, had relied on monthly services from Rabbi Henry Danziger, who was an emeritus rabbi from Memphis. And those trips were suspended last year at the outside, at outset of the pandemic. So that's what it currently says. It says it's unclear if Rabbi Danziger will continue hosting uh, services in Cleveland when it's safe to do so. One of the things that I need to do as I wrap this up is get back in touch and see what, what the status is for them. And the most surprising occurrence uh, that is, is updated in the encyclopedia, but actually has sort of taken another step uh, since the last update and that I need to really address, um, comes from Congregation Beth Israel in Biloxi Gulfport, which actually merged with the local Chabad house. If you're not familiar, uh, Chabad is a Jewish outreach program that's affiliated with the Lubavitcher Hasidic group. These are very observant Jews who follow pretty strict religious mandates. Um, and it means that Congregation Beth Israel, which had formerly been the state's only congregation affiliated with the conservative movement, is now an Orthodox congregation. So someone going in there uh, who might be used to one sort of worship, now is actually going to see a space where men and women are seated separately for religious services. And that's a pretty significant change and a somewhat interesting one as well. So the other big thing that I'm trying to do in terms of content, um, and it's really a major goal of mine when I look at the subfield of Southern Jewish history overall, is to make stronger connections between Jewish histories and other histories in the South. So I wrote it up here as a sort of like a mission statement, almost strengthening Southern Jewish history by making stronger connections to other fields and subfields. So in other words, I really believe that we can't tell the Jewish story in the South without paying attention to the big picture, just as I believe that we can't tell the overall, that we tell a better version, I would say, of the overall history when we pay attention to Jewish stories as well. The Jewish stories are, in many cases, fairly revealing. And the first, one of the first places I looked to do this was in regard to indigenous history. So it's pretty simple in a lot of cases to include at least a nod to the original or earlier inhabitants of the land. So uh, this is the original text for Biloxi Gulfport had a sentence that said, the French first settled in Biloxi in 1699, and for a short time it was the capital of French Louisiana. The French were not the first people in Biloxi Gulfport or in that area, um, and it seemed worth noting that. So uh, there's a sentence that goes before this, but then American Indian groups harvested oysters, flounder, and other food sources from the Gulf and its estuaries more than 3,000 years before European contact. The French first settled Biloxi in 1699, et cetera. And just you know, simple changes that at least that stretch our sense of the scope of the history and acknowledge that these places had occupants prior to the arrival of Europeans, Jews among them, um, and that those occupants had their own ways of, of developing and using the land. And I thought that was a significant thing to do. Fortunately, there are some good resources on indigenous history in Mississippi um, and good ways to sort of drop that stuff in there. In Mississippi, for the most part, so what I'm trying to do is acknowledge settler colonialism, right? That's like the fancy 
grad school word for what this is about. But uh, in Mississippi, there tends to be lag time, for the most part, between the, uh, the displacement of American Indian groups and the arrival of Jews. That's not always the case in other parts of the South, and so there's other places in the encyclopedia where those are a little bit, where you actually get some more dramatic encounters. Um, places like Montgomery, Alabama, uh, places like Arkansas and Oklahoma, where that Jewish history and that American Indian history rub up against each other a little more. For the most part, I haven't found sort of the most interesting examples of that here, but it's still worth, again, nodding to. And then also in the history of race and racism in regards to uh, black Mississippians, right? We need to do a better job in the encyclopedia of telling, of, of you know, bringing that story into it because otherwise you're not gonna really understand what Jewish people were doing in Mississippi, how they got here, um, and how they related to the overall sort of social world. So um, again, whether we're talking about Jews or any other group uh, of white people, Euro-American settlement in Mississippi just wouldn't have developed the way it did without the presence of black workers, right? That's true during the period of enslavement, and that's true later uh, under the exploitative practices of Jim Crow. So this is an update I made earlier, actually. Um, I, uh, we had at one point mentioned something about not knowing whether Jews in Lexington uh, had uh, enslaved any black workers. And uh, I think not long after I returned to the IS jail, I heard from a descendant of Jacob Sondheimer um, who, uh, who pointed out basically, we've got receipts for this. Like we've got the, uh, the slave schedule from the 1860 census and it's very clear that Jacob Sondheimer uh, enslaved 14 people, six male, eight female between the ages of two and 39. Uh, at the time of the 1860 census, uh, uh, census. And this was, again, this was an update that came at the request of his descendants who had been digging into their family history and wanted to make sure that we were telling a full and accurate story. A more recent example of this kind of updates comes from the Clarksdale entry. So uh, I don't know actually when this, this was put in there, but at some point there is a paragraph that talks in part about the ways that Jews were accepted in Clarksdale uh, as part of the local community, and, and by that they really meant local white community. Um, and uh, the line goes, according to member Abe Isaacson, the Borman Lumber Company donated part of the material required for the foundation of the building, and the sheriff's office donated free prison labor for many weeks. And they're talking about the construction of uh, Clarksdale's first synagogue in about 1910. So you see a lumber company who's donating some, uh, some materials, and you see that there's free labor. Well, look, it's Clarksdale, Mississippi, it's 1910, we don't have to, we know who that labor was. And it's worth saying. So the text now reads, during construction of the first local synagogue in 1910, according to Isaacson, the sheriff even donated, quote, several weeks of prison labor to the project, and then parentheses, almost certainly provided by incarcerated black men. Even limited acceptance by white Christians, in other words, allowed Jews to benefit from white supremacy and Jim Crow segregation. So this is more analytic. Right? It's not just descriptive, it's got a little bit of analysis and I'm trying to really name the power dynamics in play and how Jews fit into those power dynamics. Because if we're gonna understand Mississippi, if we're gonna understand Jewish history here, we need to be uh, direct and clear about those things. So why these changes now? Um, I think I've sort of explained this, but the first pass at the, in the, at the encyclopedia was really about gathering the basic data and we've got it. We've got filing cabinet after filing cabinet full of local Jewish history. And it was really about telling this highly specific story of local Jewish communities. And that was in part because so many communities uh, were closing or have closed since then or were dwindling in ways where it wasn't going to be as easy or even possible in some cases to get that history if we didn't do it uh, really early in this century. But now we've got a chance to go back and enrich those local histories, enrich that Jewish content by working in more analysis and by tying those Jewish histories to the bigger picture and making sure that we're telling a, a really full story. And it's exciting to be able to do that now. So in terms of the future of the encyclopedia, a couple things I've been thinking about um, are adding more and interactive features. Right? Um, there's all sorts of new digital humanities tools available. They're pretty easy to use, and as soon as I can get some interns in to help me actually build the data sets and you know, make sure everything's working smoothly, you know, we can do things like add timelines, uh, more interactive maps, 
Um, I had another example here. Maybe some user-generated content where people can submit pictures, stuff like that, are all things that we can do pretty easily now, right? It's amazing what you can do. Um, and then also, I'd like to develop some topical essays for the encyclopedia. I've talked about this for a long time, um, and at some point I need to figure out how that sort of that work process flows alongside uh, the ongoing revisions, right? But it would be really nice, I think, for someone to get to the encyclopedia and not just have the opportunity to read local history articles, but to get some big picture overviews of Jewish, of, of you know, various sort of Jewish history topics in the region, right? Whether that's uh, sort of Jewish, uh, you know, economic trends, whether that's relationships uh, between Jews and African Americans in the South, whether that's Jewish religious practice in the South. Some big picture overviews that then link, you know, through specific examples to our local history pages. Um, so that's sort of the future. Um, that's what I've got for today. Thanks a lot for your time, and uh, it looks like we've got, uh, you know, a good bit for questions. Oh, Josh, if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone. All right. Hi, two questions. The first one, how much information do you have on the Brookhaven Lincoln County here? Excuse me. And the other one is, since the temple has become a museum, are you still tracking that area? In Brookhaven, yeah. Um, so actually, uh, Rachel Myers, do you know what year Brookhaven closed? Do you happen to remember that? Or I'm going to say 2015. That's about yeah, early in the tw so early. So the question was about Brookhaven. Early in the 20 teens, the Brookhaven Jewish community uh, decided to stop operating uh, as a you know they had a building. They said they stopped operating the building. Uh, as a synagogue, and they turned over ownership to uh, the Lincoln County Historical Society, is that correct? And yeah, and at that time it became uh, the museum, but it also, and actually uh, Rachel Myers here, you know, worked on this project. They also put in, uh, I believe it's a permanent exhibit that explains a few things about Jewish life and history in Brookhaven, as well as explaining some aspects of Jewish religion through artifacts and through the, the uh, architecture of the synagogue. So, um, at the moment, are there Jewish people living in Brookhaven? A handful? Uh, less than five. Less than five, uh, including members of the Samuels family. Um, and uh, yeah, so we of course have, have contact there. Um, part of the agreement, I believe, with it when the ISJL worked on that museum exhibit, we also give an annual talk down there. So either our uh, director of rabbinical services or me or someone else typically goes down and actually gives a talk uh, in Brookhaven for the local historical society. So we keep in touch with them and, and yeah, and have kept track. Historical society down there. And I know Stuart did the first talk. Yeah, so Stuart Rockoff did the first talk down there. I actually, my first talk back at the IS jail in 2017 when I returned after getting my PhD was our annual talk down there and I gave a talk on Jewish history in Brookhaven. Um, and we, yeah, we have a fair amount of material because we had that close, fairly close relationship. So. Yeah, so the question was about, what, about Jewish people meeting in the local church. Uh, Methodist Church until the building was built. And I'm sure we have that. Uh, you know, Mississippi, there's, there's decent secondary sources on a number of Mississippi Jewish communities, um, and I'm sure that that gets mentioned uh, in our entry. We typically pick up on things like that. The entries tend to include instances where you see the local community, usually the local white community, providing resources for a Jewish community sort of as it's getting on its feet. That tends to be the sort of thing that makes it into our entries. So. Uh, why were so few Orthodox communities started in the, in the Lower South? Yeah, so um, the Deep South attracted fewer, well, the, so, okay, two things there. First, many, many, many of these small town Jewish communities actually started out relatively Orthodox upon founding. We tend to think of sort of Jews from Central Europe as always having been reform, but they weren't necessarily. A lot of congregations in the Deep South would have started relatively traditional, but then within 10 to 20 years, uh, a faction usually sort of took over and affiliated with the reform movement, in part because it was just so hard to maintain strict orthodoxy here. You simply did not have 
uh, the Jewish infrastructure necessary to do things like maintain Jewish dietary laws, um, to just a whole host of practices, right? Whether that's sort of the ritual bath called the mikvah, whether that's the availability of a moil, which is a, a ritual circumciser uh, for, for you know, any baby boys that are born, um, on down the list. Um, and so outside your largest cities, um, there was a certain amount of self-selection. If you were really dedicated to Orthodox Jewish practice, you probably didn't come down this way in the first place, or if you did, you stuck to Memphis, New Orleans, or some of the larger towns. Um, so it was a little bit, so there's self-selection, there's people sort of accommodating themselves to the local environment. Um, there are also a number of congregations that did things to appeal to sort of the broad range of Jewish practices. So there are small towns in the South where you saw, uh, for example, um, actually I think Vicksburg had some of this, where you had basically a reform service for most of the holidays, but for the big holidays, there might also be like an Orthodox service in the basement. So in some days, so in some cases you had, uh, again, that accommodation of a variety of practices in the early 20th century. Um, but, but yeah, self-selection and lack of Jewish infrastructure is the, is the biggest answer there. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about a, a philanthropist from Natchez named George W. Armstrong. They named the, the public library after him, but he was a uh, racist uh, old man, and he was a sometime resident of Natchez, but he wrote a lot of anti-Jewish stuff, and I was just wondering what kind of effect he may have had on the community in, in Natchez. Yeah, I, I don't know about that specific example of Armstrong and Natchez. Um, this question of anti-Semitism in the South has been, uh, is kind of an interesting one within the subfield of Southern Jewish history. So Southern Jewish history 100 years ago was pretty invested and, and really through I don't know, the 18, 1980s or so, was in a lot of cases invested in demonstrating um, that Jewish people were uh, you know, pretty at home in the South, pretty comfortable here, and had really contributed to the development of Jewish life in the region. And so uh, for a long time, Southern Jewish history sort of de-emphasized the importance of anti-Semitism. Um, in some cases, sort of uh, even sort of saying, look, there's much more anti-Semitism in the North than there is the South, right? Um, in part because there's so few Jews in the, house, in the South, like why bother? like, you know, instituting a whole bunch of really formal restrictions on Jews in most parts of the South, because you don't actually need to, because, you know, we're less than 1% of the population. Um, but I think more recent histories have, have really shown that there's, um, that there is sort of, uh, let's see, relative parity in anti-Semitism, regardless of region. Um, and so you do have sort of examples of prominent Southerners uh, really being strongly and publicly anti-Semitic um, in ways that would have affected Jewish experiences in a place. Um, and I think newer histories of the Jewish South are contending uh, with those facts a little bit more. That's sort of my answer there. But it, it's sort of a live question, like how we would describe anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish experience uh, in its regional differences. Um, I read a history uh, book that um, stated that the number of Jews that participated in slave trade was uh, actually very minuscule, that it was um, compared to non-Jews, and that I think it was only approximately 1% of Jews who participated, so 99% were non-Jews. Do you have statistics on that? I mean, if 1% of people in the South, it, it, Jewish participation in enslavement and in the slave trade is roughly representative. It's not, greater or smaller than we would really expect. Um, in, in general, the, um, there's a book from the 1960s by Rabbi Bertram Korn that sort of speaks to this. Actually, it holds up surprisingly well for a book of that era. Um, but yeah, the, 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 there is sort of an anti-Semitic uh, trope that Jews were sort of the instigators of the trade of enslaved people from Africa into the Americas. Uh, it's not true. Um, but neither is it true to say uh, that Jews were any sort of less guilty than other folks. They just were smaller numbers. Um, so, so, for example, if you look at the largest slave traders, those folks who owned, uh, you know, large slave labor camps, right, euphemistically called plantations, right, these folks 
are by and large not Jewish. There are a handful of Jewish people in the South prior to the Civil War who owned maybe more than, or who enslaved maybe more than 100 people. They're pretty few and far between. But you do see significant uh, Jewish slave traders uh, in places like Charleston, uh, in Natchez, as well as people who are sort of one step removed from the trade of enslaved people uh, as in sort of, you know, in finance or through sort of credit systems and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so you see Jews sort of involved, um, but not at a sort of a higher level than, than you would expect. The complication of life in America is Jews were slave holders, fought for the Confederacy and benefited from white supremacy, but were still hounded by the Klan and listed on those placards that said no dogs, no Mexicans, no Jews, no Negroes. Do you address that in the encyclopedia? Uh, like I said, the, right now the encyclopedia is primarily made up of these local histories. And so I think what, when I say I want some big analytical overarching essays, right, I think I, I try to with, say with Clarksdale, I think the way that I've updated Clarksdale is to try to talk about sort of the contingency of Jewish acceptance in white society, um, the ways that it, it, in some ways it depended on sort of towing the line with regards to white supremacy, right, and indeed benefiting from white supremacy. But what, what we don't have right now are those big overarching essays, that big essay that says like, hey, here is how you know, historians think about, right, this question of, uh, of sort of, I, I don't really like the phrase conditional whiteness, but, but something like that. Um, here's how historians are thinking about the ways that Jews fit into white society at different places in different times. Um, yeah, I don't, we, we're not fully offering that yet because again, it's based on the local histories and to really get that, I think a really good view of that, you gotta be doing something that's a little bigger and a little more synthetic. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I'm trying to get us toward that point where we're telling that story in the complicated way and in the way that really deals with the issue. I, I, I have um, a, a couple of questions. One is uh, when, when you talk about Jewish people, uh, you, you talk, talk about, about them as, um, as, as if it's one big group without a differentiation within the group. And question two has to do with education. Um, educating the young people um, to, to to identify with the Jewish culture. Um, if, 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 um, if we're it's okay to teach the Holocaust, but now there is a big uh, dialogue going on about not allowing uh, um, educators to teach slavery in grades K through 12. So I, I think there's a contradiction here. Great, okay, so there's, these are two great questions. Um, the first question is about differentiation. Um, I, I did, I was, you know, gave a pretty short overview and I didn't speak to the varieties of difference among Jews uh, who uh, live in Mississippi, in the United States, and, and in the South. Um, so yes, uh, you know, I, I, there are, we, oftentimes Jewish immigration to the United States is characterized as sort of two distinct waves. There's a bunch of historiography on why that's not quite correct, but essentially uh, the majority of Jews arriving here in the mid-19th century are from Central Europe. Uh, the majority of the Jews arriving here um, from 1880 to 1920 are from Eastern Europe. Right, and they come out of, you know, so essentially Russian Empire. We, we, they have different experiences, um, and we do find some differentiation in terms of religious practice, right? You've got your Jews who arrive here and either have assimilated already or acculturated already, uh, and who are interested, uh, maybe not that interested, in maintaining Jewish religious practice, even if they remain ethnically Jewish. And you have those Jews who work really hard to maintain Jewish religious practices in some unlikely places, right? There's still, you know, um, 
uh, orthodox-ish congregation in Greenwood, right? Um, so you've got those stories, but you've also got Sephardic Jews. You've got Jews from uh, North Africa from, who had been originally in the Iberian Peninsula uh, from places like uh, Greece and Turkey who come to the south. Not in huge numbers in Mississippi. Uh, Montgomery has a, you know, historically had a Sephardic congregation. Nowhere in Mississippi did. But there's all of those differences. And then increasingly in the United States, you have racial dif difference among Jews. Um, it's estimated that something like, I think I want to say 10 to 15% of self-identified American Jews at the present moment are people of color, right? And that includes a whole bunch, that's Latinx, uh, that's Asian Pacific Islander, and that's folks uh, who are black or African American. Um, so there's all of that variety, you're right, and I hadn't, didn't really dig into that much. When you look at Mississippi Jewish history, uh, some of those differences don't show up the same way that they do, especially if you're looking at the contemporary Jewish American scene. And then the second question was about um, sort of teaching Holocaust uh, and how it sort of relates to some of these other contested issues right now um, in K-12 education. Um, and I'm trying to speak in my role as, we can talk privately about some of this stuff later. Um, in my role as the historian for the Institute of Southern Jew Jewish Life, I would say that it is uh, imperative to teach um, to teach the truth about history um, in a variety of ways, and in ways that speak to the experiences of uh, the students involved. Um, and that um, the same way that uh, I am working hard to do a better job of reckoning with Jewish involvement um, in the history of race in these places, uh, I uh, think that our best K-12 educators are working to do the same. I think is about my answer there. Okay, um, the question I have, and I'm from Natchez, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. There was a, growing up, uh, and in my mother's generation, there was a large uh, Jewish population there. Um, my question is, a lot of other immigrants that come to America end up changing their name, their last name, in order to assimilate, okay, with Americans um, and to identify with them. Was there not a significant, or is there a reason why the Jewish community uh, did not necessarily change their names? Or is there a stronger identity in being Jewish? Um, that's one question. And then the second one is, we have a very large city cemetery in Natchez and there is a very large Jewish section of the cemetery. My question is, is there some way other than by name that you would identify the Jewish people? Okay, so the first question is about Jewish names. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't make the, I'm not gonna stake the claim that Jewish identity is stronger than other, say, European ethnic identities. Um, that come to the United States. One difference is that you do have, you know, that as non-Christians, uh, Jews are less likely, that, you know, there's this religious difference that, uh, that then means, along with it, traditionally, prohibitions against intermarriage. Not that intermarriage didn't happen and doesn't happen, it sure does, I'm the product of one, um, big proponent. But uh, the, um, but all this is to say that uh, the religious difference component might mean that you get that Jewish identity has a durability that maybe some other types of ethnic identity don't. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. There are plenty of Jewish people who arrive in this country, acculturate, assimilate, and who don't raise Jewish kids. And that's true in the 19th century, and that's true today. Um, not that we have that much Jewish immigration today, but you get the point. Um, with regard to name changes, there are definitely Jews who change their name. Actually, a really good example is the Three Foot Building in Meridian. That's correct? Okay. So Three Foot is just um, a direct, I believe I heard this, is just like a direct trans translation of the name Dreyfus. So Dreyfus, three feet in German, Three Foot. So you do get name changes. You get people... Um, you know, you get people who drop from, who drop like a suffix from the name. So like a, rabbin in it, a rabbinowitz becomes a, a rabin. Um, you get a, uh, 
some long name that starts with a K just gets dropped to K. You get a man named David Yampolsky. Uh, I've translated some of his memoirs that were written in Yiddish, uh, who uh, was, uh, at one point he was in Georgia, and he would go out to the countryside, and he was a peddler in the countryside, and he would introduce himself as David Yampolsky, and none of the farmers could say Yampolsky, so they just started, so he just changed his last name to Davis, so he becomes David Davis. So there's plenty of examples of Jews changing their names, and you get, in some cases, people buried in Jewish cemetery sections where you look at the last name and go, you know, that doesn't sound Jewish, but it was just, they picked it for one reason or another. Um, on the question of finding Jews historically, uh, uh, the best way to know that someone is Jewish is synagogue records or burial records. So, if they're, so Jewish cemeteries tend to be Jews are buried with Jews, um, and uh, there are rules about who can be buried there, and there are rules about all sorts of stuff. But um, finding somebody in a Jewish cemetery is a great way to know they were Jewish. Um, outside of that, uh, there's sort of a series of factors. If I, if I hear a name and I go, oh, that person might be Jewish, and I'm doing some historical work, I go to the census, I see where they were born or where their parents were born, and if I get a place that was a major source of Jewish immigration, that helps. There are names that are pretty clear. I mean, Cohen, sure. Goldman, a lot of the time. Partial, my last name is not Jewish. Um, those are all clues, uh, and then you look at occupational patterns, and some, sometimes you sort of find yourself triangulating and making a guess. Um, but I usually try not to sort of name somebody as a Jew in one of my histories unless I've got a really clear, you know, line of proof. Um, but those are all the places you go. We have come close to the top. We've come to the top another hour. But we have a question from the live stream, and I want to get you to address it quickly if you can. Didi Baldwin asks, why were Jews allowed in the Citizens Council? Is it because the Citizens Council portrayed itself as a respectable businessman, as respectable businessmen who weren't, as racist on, uh, or barbaric as the KKK? Yeah, so the question, so I, I would recommend anybody that wants, if you really want to learn about Southern Jews and civil rights, uh, your first stop uh, should be Clive Webb's book, uh, Fight Against Fear. It's by Clive Webb, Fight Against Fear. Um, and he does write about uh, the question of Jews and the Citizens Council. So the council, again, it, it wanted to portray itself as respectable. and. There was anti-Semitism among white citizens council and among the white citizens council members. There were individual chapters of the white citizens council that would become, say, vectors for the dissemination of anti-Semitic literature. Right? Oftentimes this was sort of stuff based on the idea that the civil rights movement was a Jewish slash communist sort of puppet show or something like that. Um, but at a sort of a top-down level, the council really did work to distance itself from anti-Semitism. Again, and, and as sort of the, the person with the question uh, noted, that was part of their um, uh, attempt to uh, put on this respectable public face, uh, despite whatever their private activities or private thoughts might have been about Jews. There was also, I think, a sense that it was a way of sort of using, I think, one type of pluralism or one type of toleration um, to, uh, to you know, appear reasonable um, while at the same time uh, being strong proponents of another type of intolerance, um, which I think is a, a, a tactic that you, you know, see here and there from time to time. Thank you all for being with us today. I hope that you will come back next week for Curtis Wilkie and his new book on the murder of Vernon Damer. But for now, help me thank Josh Parshall for this great program. <laughs>